Hello, and welcome to week three of the ACE workshop. Um, we're going to do a bit of an orientation to the week today, and I will start as usual um, with a quick introduction. Um, but what I really want to say this week is that it's become very clear uh, that the workload of the workshop uh, can balloon as much as you will allow it. Um, and I want to say two things about that. The first is that um, you're free to spend as much time on it as you want. So obviously, uh, you know, do all of the work and then more as recommended if that's helpful to you. Um, but I do want to keep coming back to the, to the point of the workshop, which is really not anything external to you. So the point of the workshop is only 100% for you to feel prepared, particularly for this fall. Like, yes, it's great to learn things that will enrich you and your pedagogy for a long time, but particularly to prepare for this fall. So I think what that means is that if you are doing an exercise and feeling pressed for time and the exercise is not feeling like it is super important to do in order to prepare for fall, it is fine to let that go. Um, next week, we are going to be turning to the final uh, ACE checklist and preparing for some guided self-assessments that you're going to do with your mentor or with a partner. Even for those checklists, um, we are assuming that you will reflect on all pieces of it, but we are not assuming that in order to pass the workshop or whatever, that you actually complete or feel like you do every single thing in the checklist. The things that you don't get to on the checklist, I think what will be helpful is just that you are aware that there's a little gap there so that you can decide, you know what, from my personal class, that gap is not important or you know, okay, I have a, a bit of a weak spot. I got to keep an eye on that, maybe um, plan around it a little bit. So please don't feel like it is important to us that you check every box on either the checklist or the weekly duties. What's important to you is that you check every box that makes you feel uh, prepared for fall. So these are things to chat about with your mentor or to um, uh, put in the open discussion channel of Teams if you have any questions. But uh, please take the pressure off yourselves a little bit if you're feeling like uh, the work is hard, particularly for those of you, um, and I think there's not that many, but there's a handful who are also working in the Quality Matters course, which has also turned out to be, I think, um, quite a lot of work. So be gentle on yourselves. Um, so with that, I will tell you what the plan for today is. And in order to do that absolutely accurately, I'm going to go back to my list. Um, so Martha is going to do, as she did last week, a quick review of the highlights of week one. Um, and then Hannah is going to talk a little bit about some of the takeaways from our week on connection. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about um, week three equity and Martha will walk through the curriculum of this week. So with that, I am going to turn it over to the week one review with Martha. Hey everybody, can you hear me okay? Um, I am going to share my screen to take us through um, the week two review. Um, give me just a second, I'm not working on my regular computer at the moment. So I just want to make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Um, let me just pull up Teams here. And you should be able to see my Teams window now. And uh, as with last week, um, there's a tab up here for weekly summaries. Um, and week two is now here. Um, you're welcome to spend as much or as little time with this as you like. Um, it's really just a tool um, for those of you who find it useful to um, pull some notable pieces from some of the conversations that went on this week around connection um, and also rigor because we had kind of a side conversation about that as well and there was lots of great discussion in that channel. Um, 
I collated uh, or brought together all of the links that anybody shared. Um, if you may have missed something, hopefully I caught everybody um, who shared something here. Um, but this is the really important section, questions, concerns, and feedback that we want to spend a little bit of time on now. Um, this came from things that we heard either from participants or mentors. So I'm going to invite Robin now to unmute and we will talk through a few of these things. The first one she has already talked about, which is that we know for, for many of you, the workshop may feel like it's a little bit more than you bargained for. But again, we want you to focus on the things that are useful to you, your class, your students, and your pedagogy um, in preparing for the fall. Robin, this was another thing that came up in one of the mentor groups was this question of seat time, which has been, um, you know, in the past usually correlates to the number of hours students are expected to spend in a classroom. Um, there are kind of formulas for figuring that out when you go fully online or hybrid, but with high flex, where there's, um, you know, the ability for students to work online, but asynchronously, what does that mean for something like seat time? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, I don't care. Um, next question. No, I'm just kidding. But um, I just put into the chat. Uh, the, the real answer is that I don't care. Um, and the reason that I don't care is that um, Really, I just can't imagine that we're going to have a conversation for more than five minutes in which anybody can convince me that seat time makes sense for any measure of, of learning. Um, but particularly that, aside, that aside, if you are interested in seat time and credit hours, and, and to be fair, we should all be interested because honestly, this is the unit in which we all dwell. So we should be interested in asking questions. Um, I did put into the chat, it's going down a little bit. If you, you know, go past all the snark and the feet time, you will see a link that I put in there. Um, this is a pretty interesting link uh, created by Granite State College. And I, I think it also does help us see some of the distinctions between a framework like ACE and the work that happens at, um, at Granite or in Quality Matters, where um, these kind of objective metrics are very important to the way they think about online learning. So I actually find this resource um, crazy but other folks have found it a little bit helpful. And what it is designed to do is to um, help you measure the amount of hours that your students are spending um, on work, which is pretty different than seat time actually, right? Time on task is different than time, but in chair. Um, so one thing you do wanna think about with seat time with online learning, and we heard from many, many Plymouth State students in the spring, that their classes got much more time intensive when they went online. This was while faculty were claiming that they were cutting back on work because they wanted to be gentle during the pandemic. What this suggests to me is that you just do have, they do have to be careful about the fact that sometimes we seem less aware of how labor intensive some of what we're assigning is. It's easier to measure time when you're just watching it pass in a classroom. So you might want to use that uh, worksheet to help yourself um, take stock of the kinds of things that you're assigning. But I would say in general, when you're thinking about online planning or you're thinking about planning during a pandemic, it's, it's more productive to think of how much work you're assigning and how much time they're going to spend on the work. And don't worry at all about who's where and when they're working. Um, so think less about seat time and more about time on task. The most important thing as always, as we say in ACE, is to ask your students and not just at the end of the semester, right? So a couple of weeks in, you can say, give me a sense of the, of the workload, right? How's it, how's it going and, and what are you spending most time on? Because you may not know, um, you may be not calculating correctly and it would be easier to hear um, from your students directly. So that's what I'd say about that. Awesome. Um, another thing that came up in one of the cohorts, I think was, I think this was probably related to the um, connecting your course to the larger context um, practice that we looked at this week was, you know, what about things like BLM and racial inequality? Um, and my answer to that would be yes. <laughs> Um, you should definitely, if, when and if it's appropriate in whatever way that you can and are comfortable with, 
be inviting your students to engage with all of the contexts um, in the world around them and that they're living through. Certainly BLM right now um, is a moment that we're teaching through. Um, and in, in the CoLab, we've been doing some programming this summer, um, having to de deal with um, issues of race in teaching. And I know we've got something scheduled over university days. And um, I don't know if Robin, if there's anything else you wanted to mention about that in terms of programming. Uh, there's stuff coming up. There's going to be, I think, a really good session during University Day that Mehdi and Felice and Meg are running. Um, and also there's a speaker potentially coming in who um, has been at Plymouth before, who I heard who is, who is good um, through academic affairs. Um, the one thing I will say about this, I'm working on a talk for something else right now, but I, as part of it, I dug into more of the data um, about COVID and uh, particularly about race and ethnicity. So it was looking um, at everything from hospitalizations to unemployment, to who's allowed to work at um, remote positions, um, to who has the most precarious frontline jobs in a pandemic. All of this was no surprise, reminding me in data <laughs> that COVID and the BLM um, protests are intertwined events. Um, and maybe that's something to think about as you're either creating COVID workarounds in your class or thinking about content and how your disciplines connect um, with these issues is just to remember that they're not discrete. And that can also be another way to engage some of the Black Lives Matter content um, is that when you are, uh, you know, when you're talking about COVID and remote work, like if you dig into that data and you want to share some of that with your students, um, you're going to find um, not just socioeconomic class, but race, for example, um, are co-indicators with, um, with a lot of the COVID challenges. So anyway, interesting stuff. I'll share that talk is next week and um, it'll be recorded, but I'll also share the slides of it because the slides have a lot of really um, sort of eye-opening uh, data. And again, I'll just remind us that um, part of what ACE tries to do, and this is of course the theme for this week as well, is to suggest that um, it's at the margins where we design, right? So. Um, especially when we have these conversations about retention. Um, when we're talking about retention issues, we are talking about margins, right? So retention as, um, as a strategy doesn't work if you look at majorities, right? Because majority of students, meant, you know, at least half, right, are easily being retained. Um, that's just their normal path. So we have to design for the precarious and the vulnerable um, around those edges. So when you're thinking about your course setup, you may feel like, oh, I'm only talking about two or three or four students as opposed to the other 22. But those are actually the, the precarious students that we are losing at such an alarming rate. So keep that in mind. It's one of the reasons why equity is part of our um, ACE framework, because when you look at the data around COVID, it is very clear um, that it is not hitting us all equally um, and that all of those retention issues that we had before where we were losing vulnerable students are augmented. So those margins are even uh, larger now. Um, so keep that in mind that, you know, you're going to be serving both students and the institution in terms of retention if you can really think about who's being um, left out or impacted in difficult ways. Um, and that's great. Um, I think I'm, I'm happy to hear that that was coming up in conversations though, that in thinking about teaching through the context, people are recognizing that the context of COVID is actually more complex than just COVID, that there's a lot more to this. Hopefully we can continue to have these conversations and help people think about um, how to how not, not only to pull this into their classes, but this week in equity, how to care for those students who are impacted in those very particular ways. Um, teams, people say it's good, but it's also not good, to which I just say yes, that is definitely true. That's usually the truth with most technology. <laughs> Actually, no, some technology is just bad. 
Um, but Teams definitely has both good points and bad points. I wanted to draw attention to this resource that Angela shared this week. It's a presentation from the Remote Summit two weeks ago by David Kellerman in which he um, talked about how he used Teams in a course this past spring to build connection in a classroom. Sounds like she found that useful. Other people might find that useful. Um, Can you just uh, fix her name while you're in there? It's killed with a B instead of an M. I know. I, that's why I just said Angela, because I re realized that as I was talking and I was embarrassed. But thank you for, <laughs> to, for pointing out your shame. <laughs> you could have changed that. Um, so yes, that's what I have to say about teams. Oh my God, look at all those submissions. Robin, people have been submitting stuff. Yeah, so, um, if you haven't noticed, um, when you submit those things, uh, they are reposting on the ACE practice pages. So if you go back to the main ACE framework page um, and click on any of the, of the practices, you will start seeing the bottom growing. And people are sharing some really fantastic things. The, the thing I'm most grateful for that you guys are sharing are shreds of your assignments and ideas. Um, it is not only helpful because you might find some usable stuff, but this is a fantastic way to build a learning community. Um, I don't, for any of you who have, for example, evaluated people, like sometimes in my job, I have to go observe people's teaching for evaluations. And it's kind of a bummer that it's for evaluation because you're like, these glimpses into my colleagues' lives are some of the um, best ways that I have found to connect to my community. So um, if you have a chance, go back to those practice pages and browse. I will tell you they're not uh, particularly edited. So sometimes there might be one that shows up there that's like, how did that get there? Just because somebody was a little confused about the, the, um, the, the way the system works, but you'll really find some terrific stuff in there. It's also, um, you know, obviously we started this by saying people feel overwhelmed. We're not trying to add a whole lot more. Now go back and look at what other people have done. But if there was a practice that we've already addressed over the last two weeks that really resonated with you or that you were really challenged by, you're just like, I don't really know how I'm going to do this in my class. Going back and seeing what other people shared may help, um, may spark some ideas for you. So that's a great way to kind of focus your attention a little bit on those submissions. Um, and then I'm just going to confess that this last one, are we connected yet? I have no idea what that refers to other than that last week was about connection. But I did this last night after two very long days of moving and nope, don't know what that is. So we're going to go to the next thing on our agenda this morning. I'm going to invite Hannah to the microphone. She's going to lead again a little informal discussion with all of you who want to share any thoughts you have about last week. Yes, um, and I think you're going to stop sharing your screen, um, Martha. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I would love to invite uh, folks to unmic if they would like to share um, strategies that they found related to building connection in the classroom, uh, maybe anxieties or concerns or barriers that um, they are still kind of feeling they're up against with building community in the classroom. I looked through our discussion and I'm definitely seeing some some reflection about feeling like you have face-to-face -face community building down but online community building is a little bit more of unwalked territory for folks um, which I think we all can kind of relate to um, and I definitely saw some stuff about letting students um, bring what they know about online communities to the table because I think we might find that students have experienced these online communities maybe more than we have. Um, but those were just a couple observations I made from looking through our discussion boards. But if anybody wants to unmic um, and share theirs, love to hear them. Um. Liz, uh, when I think about, I can't remember if I posted about this in my brain, in my journal, somewhere, <laughs> um, community and connection, the more I think about it, the, it, it helps mitigate against what I was talking about at the beginning of the meeting, which was this overwhelm of tech choices, mm -hmm. because it just 
gets re-clarified that like the tech will fail. The tech will fail. Like I'm at digital pedagogy online and the tech failed big time yesterday. Like there was a huge crash because of course everyone was like piling on to this, this blogging app or whatever and it just got overwhelmed. But that the one thing that, that maybe doesn't have to break, like if, if the connection is there, then it doesn't matter what breaks. I mean, it matters what breaks, but like, so I've just been thinking about how important it is gonna to be to me to connect with each of my students individually and as a group early. It's gonna be weighted early in terms of, of like having sort of setting that tone. And so it's been, re it's been a reassurance thinking about community and connection. It's been a reassurance against feeling a little, um, manic about channels and tools. Yeah. Um, it's interesting what you say about um, establishing community early. Um, and I think I've, I've definitely seen folks talk about that, how they feel that it's very important to make these connections early and make strong connections early. And I think that kind of puts a lot of pressure on us um, for sure. And being um, successful in building those connections as well. Um, and I urge folks to um, don't beat yourself up if it doesn't work the first time around um, too. Um, but I also love that uh, point you made, um, Liz. Tech will crash, but community remains, connection remains, um, which I kind of just appreciate poetically. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sure, does anybody else want to share? Um, I, I don't want to call her out, but Kristen Stelmach, if you're there, um, I did notice in the discussion, I kind of loved your post about reframing how we think about participation grades um, into more of uh, thinking about building community and folks being part of the building of the community. Um, she's not on micing, so I'm not going to, oh, okay, she's not on mic. Kristen, I'm sorry to call you out, but I really loved that part. And I was wondering if you'd like to explain, discuss a little bit. Um, sure, it's really simple. Um, I just changed um, some of the language in my syllabus um, from a participation grade, which is usually about 10% of my uh, course grades to um, community building and then um, and I talked about what that might mean. And I think it somewhat, it kind of comes from my position as a quieter person who sometimes needs some time to process um, before I contribute to a large group, except when I'm called out by somebody. <laughs> I was just about to say, except when Emma <laughs> makes you talk. <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, I appreciate the chance to talk about it a little bit. So um, I talk about the different ways, um, just briefly in my syllabus, um, that people can contribute to um, uh, building a community as opposed to just participating, you know, just saying something for the sake of saying something. And then I build a little place in my syllabus for um, students to talk about, you know, what kind of learning community works for them. Like what do they, what can a teacher do? What can their fellow students do? Um, and then we, there's a little activity that goes with that where they have time to think um, on their own about the answers to those questions. And then we go back a couple days later um, and they'll talk in small groups about those things. Sorry, my coffee's not kicking in quite yet. <laughs> but um, <laughs> talk in small groups about what works for them, you know, what can a teacher do? What are the important things to them? What are the values that matter to them in a learning community? Um, and then they, we kind of collaborate and put those together and then I rebuild those into the syllabus. So it's, it's really simple, but it actually, um, I think it's a, a good start to the semester, kind of sets a nice tone uh, for what is important in my classroom. Thanks. Yeah. I, yeah, thank you. Um, and I, again, really appreciate kind of the reframing of what we traditionally call the participation grade. And I feel like maybe it kind of takes some of the pressure off of 
the facilitator, the instructor as well, because it's students that are talking about what makes a community for them, rather than the facilitator deciding this is what a community looks like. So it's a little bit more collaborative too, and maybe a little bit more authentic. Um, and please ignore my cat. She wants to be part of the community. Hi, Holland. <laughs> Liz, do you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I loved uh, what Kristen wrote, and I've also been um, trying to sort of describe participation in, in class as, you know, like, yes, everyone understands what talking sounds like, but that that's not the only way to participate or engage. When I've had conversations with, with students at the beginning of the semester, and I plan on doing this again um, this fall, I like to also, not just to ask them sort of what they require or what they want or need in a learning community in a in a classroom community but also what they feel they can contribute mm -hmm. um i like asking sort of both of those questions like what is it that we sort of that you'll need for us to do for you and like not this crass but like what can you do for us like what mm -hmm. you know what is it you know maybe you're you know really good at like listening and sort of making connections with what people are saying to each other, stuff like that. So um, yeah, I just want to endorse that because it's, it's been helpful actually. And I think it, it potentially gives students, um, remind students of their role in making things happen. Like, and that I'm not, that the teacher is not the only one in charge of like meeting needs or like granting wishes. Yeah. Um, and this seems like maybe a good segue to into talking about equity as well, because students might um, have different ways that they can show uh, their engagement in class. Um, and I, with that, I'm, I think I'm going to let Martha or Robin take it away. I'm going to. Yeah, I'll just say a quick thing first, and then I'll let Martha talk and get the tour. Um, I just wanted to say that this was actually where the ACE framework was born. Um, can I just was, stop, Robin? Can I just stop the recording a second? Oh yes, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, 